All right, back to where we were. Um, I think a lot of the, all right, so like a lot of the team is still like much of a learning curve. So as far as like information I'm going over, it's probably uh, very general but, and like where we're at so far. So there's definitely like ways to branch out of where we currently are. So we can start. So the reason that EV is in the equation is because a lot of teams are switching. Um, and it's definitely still in its infancy. A lot of the teams, uh, I think, I forgot the exact statistic, but very few even past tech inspection, let alone have good like lap times. Um, so with all the resources that we have at UF, I think we can uh, get in early and do very well. So as far as like a general overview, we're using a three-phase um, AC motor, and I'll get um, more into that. And then we're using an inverter from our battery pack, which will turn the DC power into AC. And then we are using a BMS to protect the batteries and a separate 12 volt battery for our low voltage system. And in more detail, I'll go over that. So we're using the MRAX 228 medium volt, which is a uh, probably doesn't mean much to you guys right now. Um, here's some of the statistics if you know anything about motors. One thing uh, I like to note here so part of our, our kind of general efficiency is the efficiency between our motor and the motor controller, which is this uh, 97 uh, 92% right there. Um, so from that's directly from pack power to mechanical power that we can output. So here's some more information backing up what I was talking about. Um, a lot of teams have a, sm a lot smaller pack size than us, and uh, it's because a lot of them can't like really push the limits of uh, like good lap times. They have to drive very conservatively, and uh, making a large pack is very difficult. It's like, really hard to package, and um, it requires a lot more expensive parts, and sometimes just a little bit harder to design. A lot of teams are using the same um, motor as us, but uh, with our pack or with our uh, park configuration, we're able to max out our motor um, specs a little bit better than they can. So let's go into some more general knowledge. So with motors in general, here's a DC motor. Um, the force is going to be in the direction of the cross product of the current and the uh, magnetic field. So with a DC motor, there's brushes that will maintain contact with the commutator right there. And that's going to ensure that current is flowing in the right direction um, on the coils. So I guess, does anyone have any questions about this? It's pretty general. Not exactly what we're using, but just a baseline that uh, magnets and current cause force. So as an alternative, we're using a three-phase AC motor, where the rotor, the part that spins, is the permanent magnet and not the outside. And the magnetic field is turning around that rotor. And so that the pole is pulling the rotor along with the rotating magnetic field. And so you can see kind of an example of how that occurs. That the, when you take the magnitude of all these vectors, it's where the pole is constantly shifting. And so you get that with three phase AC, where you have um, the voltage across here and here being each phase um, with the same color. So to get to that three phase power, we need or from batteries, we need some sort of inverter. Um, this is the one that we chose. A lot of the decisions behind this are like rules um, related. So if you decide to get more into our system, then you can take a look at some of that. Motor controller is able to tune like how fast the motor is going. And it does this by using a uh, pulse width modulation or PWM. So it will, because it's tra transferring to three phase AC, it's going to um, basically, from a duty cycle of 100%, where it's like on the entire time, um, and then everything underneath it's going to limit the um, or lower the average current seen by the motor. So that allows us to change speeds um, very quickly with a very fast uh, reaction time because it's going, uh, I mean, electricity is pretty instant, goes right to the motor, and we can uh, get a very accurate control over our motor. And then another cool part about motors is. Uh, and why they're extremely efficient is because of back EMF. So as the same way you can look at the, the pictures I pulled up earlier, I can go back to them real quick. So the same way you can flow th current through those uh, coils. Um, if it spins, it can flow current out of those coils. So the back EMF is the like backwards generated voltage from that, from that motor. So you spin a motor very, very fast, and then 
you, because of your induced current on the coils. And then a voltage is then induced back into the coils, which lowers the um, voltage across the uh, coils. So I'll go back just once again to explain that a little better. So as this spins faster and faster, the actual voltage seen across each phase is going to um, decrease. And so because of that, um, it then takes a lot less current to, to maintain high speeds, um, which is very cool. But it also um, creates like kind of a limit to how much torque you can apply when you're at very high speeds. And I'll put a little bit more information on that. So you can see towards the end here of your uh, torque curves, the torque tends to fall off. Um, with our motor specifically, we don't really see a lot of that impact, but with other motors, if you're going at very, very high speeds, it eliminates some of your ability to apply more current. And here's kind of math to explain that a little more. So if you're applying 48 volts to a motor, and you have like one ohm impedance on the motor, you get you need to apply 48 amps, but if you're generating the back EMF of like 40 volts, um, your voltage across the coils is now only eight volts, so your ability to apply current is much lower, it also takes a, little, a lot less current to maintain that speed. So there's, um, that's a huge benefit to why motors are very efficient. So now getting into our accumulator, um, this is kind of like where the bulk of the work has been going for the last like, year. So our goal is to design a 500 volt pack uh, with the capacity to finish the race. 500 volts is chosen because it's the max of our motor um, and the max of our other, and our inverter and, and several other parts. Um, so some general stuff, the more cells, I get, if any of you have seen our EV stuff, we just have a ton of cells. That's kind of where we are right now. Um, and we're packaging them into little modules. So each of those cells, or if you ever opened a battery pack, um, the more of those cells you add in series, the more the higher voltage you get um, at the same capacity. And then the more you add in parallel, the higher capacity you get at the same voltage. So um, some more information on that later. So here's some information on our cell types. Um, I'm not sure if anyone knows a whole lot about batteries, but we're using the NCA cells. And as far as other um, comparable EV um, cell types, they give us the most um, energy per kilogram. So they're a very good choice and we do a good job on that. Some more interesting stuff about batteries, the uh, full capacity. Um, or I guess from the data sheet, or they just say um, four amp hours or 4,000 milliamp hours. And like the higher load that you put each cell under, the, the less that actually turns out to be. So you get a lot less capacity as you uh, really crank out juice from a, from a cell. So to get to some of the numbers that I mentioned earlier, like the 500 volts, um, and then what well, I also mentioned that we need to find a capacity that finishes the endurance race. So how do we do that? So we, we uh, wrote a lab sim that actually took the, it took every portion of a previous track that the IC car ran and just did some uh, physics one work to it and found like the maximum physical speed that you can go without slipping on every portion of the track uh, by finding some sort of radius. So even if it was a straightaway, it was an infinitely small radius. So you can accelerate, you can accelerate or you can get to almost an infinite physical speed. And then that is then limited by, um, like the distance of that, or the, or how, so the lapsing then simulates a perfect driver that accelerates as much as it can during that straightaway, um, goes as fast as it can around corners, and just does everything as optimal as possible. Um, and while it's doing that, is also calculating the um, drain on the voltage of the battery on, on the cells, and it's also calculating the uh, drain of the capacity. So we're getting um, very accurate data on like the current state of our pack while. Um, it's going through this track. And uh, then we can figure out what the best cell configuration is that still has juice at the end of the, the race. So um, there's definitely a lot more details to that MATLAB code, but um, going along here, our lap sim results said that we can get a very good lap time with an eight kilowatt hour battery pack. So that, and we also wanted to include a little bit of a factor of safety in there because we, uh, uh, code probably has some errors in it somewhere that someone can find. So we're about 10% 10, 10 extra capacity compared to uh, how much it takes to complete endurance. Um, and the MATLAB code also would output um, a final drive ratio um, compared with, um, I think, several hundred others. So it, it goes through like every iteration it can, and it gave us 3.2 for our current um, 
design. And, our, and that design is 112 in series and five parallel of a 3.6 nominal um, cell and four amp hours. And it's 4.2 volts maximum each cell. So our maximum voltage when we just start, like when the pack is fully charged is about like 504 volts. It's gonna be heavy. So 906 pounds, pretty good. Um, I think it's very comparable if you remove all the all the fuel, all the rest of the drivetrain for uh, the IC car. But I mean, this this is a a fair size battery pack for what we're trying to do. And that then by rules is divided into ten modules, which is a little less important to keep on. Uh, so yeah, some of the more information I was talking about earlier, um, depending on how hard we push our pack, like I was showing you with the cells, we might. Um, miss out on some of our capacity, as if we just drove the car extremely slow around the track, we'd probably see around 10 kilowatt hours instead of the eight. So going. Um, some of the more of the math I was talking about. So again, if you add cells in parallel, you can add their capacity directly, and in series you add their voltages. So that's how we get to um, say a 500 volt battery pack out of little 3.6 volt cells, and then the desired capacity. Um, from adding more in parallel, which gives us that 112 in series and five parallel. So that gives us our total cell count being 600, which is just those two numbers times themselves. It's all in a big grid or honeycomb or however people come together. All right, so then our BMS is also really important. So if anyone knows anything about battery packs, um, if the, so current flows from high voltage places to lower voltage places. So if not all of the cells are almost exactly the same voltage, you can get a lot of problems. I can have more information here. So in order to ensure that the pack is flowing current the way you want it to, we have a BMS that is trying to look for these minor imbalances in the voltage of each cell, and then it is going to move energy from the most charged cell to the least charged cell. And this keeps us safe and from things not blowing up. And this is especially important, important while it's charging. Um, so the BMS lets us, um, gives us the ability to recharge the pack safely. And when we then put a load on the pack after we recharge it, then nothing bad happens and nothing explodes. So very cool stuff. And going into module design, um, I don't know if anyone's seen our latest module. Uh, I don't believe a picture of it on here because I think I made it after these were first made. But this is one of our earlier modules. So the goal here is to use these bus bars to make those series and parallel groups that I was talking about. And then um, I believe those little strings are the fuse wire that we have, that's our rules thing. But then the goal is then to uh, spot weld um, some sort of nickel tab or fuse wire from the cell to the bus bar and more information. So kind of where we're at right now actually is we're in between testing an aluminum and PCB bus bar. So, I have more information on spot welding after this, but just to, uh, here, I can go back and forth here. So um, important things when you're looking at bus bar um, material is your power loss is coming from your current squared times the resistance of the bus bar. So the best bus bar materials in general would have the lowest resistivity and the shortest length. Um, so that's really good for copper, but copper is really hard to spot weld to because of that same issue. So there's kind of a trade-off there and something that we're trying to work around. So nickel has a very high resistivity, so it's easy to spot weld because spot weld is sending a ton of current through that nickel and then it's heating up very hot because uh, because it has a lot of, uh, and because it has a high resistivity and then that allows you to form the weld. Whereas um, spot weld and copper is nearly impossible because it's extremely conductive. So that's kind of where we're at now. We're looking to send off these. I think these arrived Friday, hopefully, yeah. So. So we're going to send these off to see if they can get spot welded at like a bigger facility with more expensive spot welders than the one that we have. Um, and we're going to try to compare this to one that's made out of aluminum, which is a lot easier to spot weld to. So some of the benefits of this is a lot of like there's a lot of rules requirements on temperature. So we need to monitor, I think, 20% of all cells. And that's a ton of wires. It's going to be spaghetti if we don't do it carefully and it's really hard to debug and things are just going to get in the way. So this kind of calms that down a little bit by uh, putting everything on one board through so the bus bar and all the sensors on one board, as well as the BMS taps that monitor each uh, series group. 
And so with that little tab at the very top, you can plug in a header and then um, have everything in like nice um, heat shrinked um, larger cables and not have a bunch of tiny loose wires. But it may not be possible because of the platform. So that's one of the issues that we're running into and working on right now. Um, so for our low voltage system, um, a lot of teams use a DC-DC converter, um, but we're choosing to do a 12 volt, um, hopefully lithium iron pack. Um, with lithium iron, we won't have to deal with using like a um, heavy um, lithium iron um, phosphate battery. Um, and I think it's definitely doable. And if you look at it from this perspective, you're just moving capacity from, uh, from the bigger pack to a smaller pack. Uh, rather than like adding capacity to the bigger pack to make sure that it can um, power all your devices. Um, and this way too, we don't get the losses of having a DC-DC uh, converter. And as well as the expensive issue that would happen if the DC-DC converter fried and you just fried everything in your local system. So Kyle definitely knows more about this than me, but um, this is CAN. So all our major devices uh, are BMS and our motor controller and our data logger all communicate with CAN. And so CAN is a serial message protocol. So it's sending, um, I guess, so you can send messages in either, like, try and think of a good example. I have the best example right now. So you can send messages where every pin is, the, is a digit in your string that you're trying to send, or you can just send it um, serially. So you can send it where each bit comes before the next one, um, all in the same line. You can kind of see that on the right side there. So you send the highs and lows based on what you're trying to send. So, or I guess this one's a better example. So you'd have some, some sort of indicator on where like you're starting, um, which uh, device you're needing to contact, and then where you're stopping, and more information on the, on the next side. So you can put all your devices on one big loop, and you can send messages between them, and they'll be able to sort out which one's for them, which one's not, and then get instructions that way. Cuts down on the amount of wires by a lot, and it's a smarter way to do things. So, all right, and then changes to um, the IC card that we have right now. We're going to have to change the rear box pretty significantly. Um, I think we're looking to get a new rear box built, but this is kind of uh, on the timeline of next year. And then other considerations. Um, or things that will have to change in the future. Suspension, there's a huge change in the weight distribution, and that's still changing pretty often because we're not sure how we're packaging the batteries completely. Um, and they do weigh 104 pounds, so that's a pretty significant amount of the car that's shifting um, based on where we want to put it. And uh, it's kind of consolidating all that weight in the back of the car where I don't know exactly the weight distribution now, but I assume it's going to be quite a bit different. And it might be a little bit higher if we're not careful on how we place them. Um, so the battery performance is also um, an issue with a lot of vibration that can cause some problems. Um, Seatback and firewall batteries are safer if they start catching on fire because they take longer, but if you are still in the car when they are on fire, then it's a lot more dangerous. So <laughs> and then cooling, um, we're not sure the full, ex um, we're not sure fully what we expect um, as far as like the battery heat dissipation. Um, but we know that we need liquid cooling for the motor and motor controller, so that's additional systems to the car um, that people can improve year after year. Um, and packaging and rearranging and drive training, I talked about that. So for the future, um, I guess where we're at now is next year we'd like to compete. We'd like to send a single motor um, to competition. And in the future, we're looking at going to four in-home motors, so every wheel has a motor. Um, that opens the door for some really unique uh, control um, controls projects like uh, torque vectoring and all kinds of stuff. Um, and then also regenerative braking, which I think we're a lot closer to than the four in motors. So that's all I got. If anyone has any questions. Maybe there's some people online. Does uh, anyone on the Zoom have any questions? No? All right. 
Oh, wait. So, I think it's often hard to consider it for closure batteries. What do you mean? Like location wise. Oh, um, we've taught, not very practical, but we talked about side pots. Ideally, we just put everything um, as close to the seat back as possible. But um, as far as alternatives for that, I'm not really sure. I, I think Pierre could answer better um, as far as what he's explored. But uh, I guess the, the issue and what we're trying to look out for is that we don't stack them too high. Um, this is a lot of weight and you can move up the, the center of gravity of the car quite a bit. Well, for right now, what are you doing with the coolant for the battery? So right now we're using um, a big fan array and in between each module, there's like a graded um, metal. And so the, um, and the cells also um, are spaced out a little bit um, wider this way so that we can get um, better airflow. Um, we have a cooling guy that's not around anymore that has a, had a lot more information to back that up. And I think there's a lot of information on the one note as well. Um, but yeah, just right now is an array of fans, but we're looking at potentially doing some sort of like intake if, if that's necessary. Um, we haven't um, load tested our modules um, under like the conditions that they're going to be in. So we have no clear understanding of how much heat we need to, to transfer. But it's all stuff to work on and parts of the kind of the learning curve of our system, a lot of stuff that we have to. Time yeah, we do have we have quite a big time frame. Yeah, so uh, this week, um, I might be swamped this week, but next week, <laughs> I think we're trying to test both the uh, the PCB and the aluminum uh, module. So hopefully, we can send out the PCBs to be spot welded elsewhere. Um, to just see if that's possible and then uh, clamp them down to our pack, um, attach the fuse wire, you might have to like solder that to get that to work, um, which isn't rules allowed, but just for the sake of testing um, and then see how both perform. Um, the PCB is a big if because I don't know, we, we used ridiculously like wide traces and I don't know how that will perform under a really high current. So we're going to put some really beefy one ohm resistors on there and uh, Try to get as high a current as possible to see how the fuse perform and uh, also see how it handles dealing with uh, a lot of heat. What? Uh, I'd like to get exact knowledge of it, but it's also uh, kind of just a proof of concept of will this melt or will it not melt? So, <laughs> but in the future, yes, there'll be more scientific um, exploration of that. Cool. All right. Seven.